Hello everyone, Dave Landry here from DaveLandry.com. This is the week and charts. I want to thank everybody for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time out of your busy schedule to be here. Thank you very much. I'm humbled by your presence. There was a disclaimer screen. As you know, you can lose money trading, or as I often sum it up, all predictions are about the future, and a lot of stuff can happen between now and then. I want to follow up on a couple things here. I want to follow up obviously the market of course but i want to follow up on this vix research and i want to talk a little bit about route days and i want to flesh out some of the things i talked about last week as i often say i'll come up with something and then i'll talk about it and it's probably not fully baked at the time and then i'll continue to work with it so i think if you can figure out when route days are occurring i think you know in the world i think there's some opportunities within the vix but i think you have to be super super cautious in that and i want to flesh out a lot of that tonight. Also, I do want to talk a little bit about the TFM 10% system, and I have a slide on that that's going to show where we are in that cycle, and I think that's very important. We take a look at that along with some other things, and then we'll take a look at crypto too. I can't imagine there's anything you want to look at there because it's in a bear market like everything else, right? But I do want to talk about that a little bit in the 30-day EMA and uh, quite a few other things as you'll see here anyway if you can figure out when these route days occur and it's my observation that they can occur really nicely in the vix related shares and that's the research i've been doing a lot of lately and i've actually discovered a lot of things that are outside of the the research that i intend and that's gonna make a lot more sense in just one second but you can see here a nice persistent move higher and this was the VIX trade that kind of started it all. I was doing the research, and this was a reversion to the mean type of trade. And let me just go through this real quick because we talked about this last week. You had that gap open, and then it began to break out. Stop went below the low. In this case, it was a trailing stop. And then the IPT was up here. And I walked through this last week, so I won't bore you too much. I know, too late, right? And this is how it all shook out and exit the remainder of it market on close and here's the actual trades you can see and again i fleshed these out last week and i'm going to show you by thinking on this trade and then i want to talk a lot about being super selective with these things obviously it'd be fantastic if you could pull an extra k here and there trading these these vic shares but these opportunities do not come along every day but if you're a patient, that's actually a good thing, though. Not that they don't come along every day, but it's a good thing that, that you're not in and out all day chasing your own tail. If you wait patiently, patiently, you could have, you can capture some really, really nice days. So around day on the downside, if you want to take a look at the P's, and this is the spiders, but you can see that for the most part, it barely made a new 15-minute high all day. And hopefully, if you're trailing a stop on something like this, you can maybe let it widen out a little bit, certainly a little bit further than a two-bar high. And sometimes on a route day, the two-bar high could be your best friend. And if you could figure out how to identify route days and only trade on route days, I think you would you would own the world. And so it is a bit of a holy grail hunt. In fact, I actually called a lot of this research that I did a while back HG days, when you do have these days that start at one bar and then to the other. Now, this does not factor in the overnight trading. So it you could argue that maybe it's not perfect, but if you are looking at an overnight chart and you're not factoring overnight trading and you're looking at the 30 EMA on the 15 minute bars, it is kind of cool that you had Landry Light the whole way down on this particular route day. So that's just another little tool that you can use. And I just, I tend to eyeball that. I don't have that in every charting package that I use, but I occasionally show it from ACP. It is built into Metastock. It's called, uh, I think it's called Daylight there. Now, when you're when you have a route day in the VIX, or when you have a, a route day in the overall market, I should say, especially to the downside, the VIX can be a, a wonderful instrument. And that kind of gave me VIX fever. And then I had to back off a little bit on the big stuff, and I'll have to I'll explain that toward the end of the presentation. So my initial thinking was 
intraday reversion to the mean, what does that mean? Well, it, it means it gets stretched from the moving average and bounces back. Now, I do have some interday, if that's the right word, systems that I published many, 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 many years ago, inspired by Larry Connors, who was really into the VIX type of research. And I showed some of that, kind of dusted it off a while back. It showed that a few months back. And it printed money for a while, and it, it was one of those settle down Beavis moments because it had to go back. I know if you're Beavis, Beavis on Butthead, I got it. <laughs> but it had to go back and, and look like the pandemic and all. There were some times where those short term systems just absolutely, I wouldn't say they blew up, but they didn't do really, really well. And that's a danger of following a pure short term system. But what we're doing here is trying to catch an intraday move. And I, I didn't get around to doing a lot of research on these VIX shares. For now, I'm using the UVXY and the SVXY, as I'll explain in a little bit more detail in a few minutes. Those are based on the futures, and I'm not sure how that could affect things, although I think longer term, it's a problem, but shorter term, it's not. Just like inverse shares on a very short-term basis, ideally an intraday basis, then it would work out nicely. Huh, huh, huh. Would you use Bollinger Bands? Um. I think Bollinger Bands might have a little bit of use for the route days. Of course, I would just eyeball them and use Landry Light, but I have experimented a little bit with them. And I'm not a huge fan of indicators, as you may know, but I think that there's you could certainly do some research with the Bollinger Bands, and the overnight issue might be a little bit of an issue with that. And as long as it's kind of hugging the top band or the bottom band, then maybe you have a route day in the works. But again, I, I kind of like to go back to just the, the blank chart. One thing I do and have recently programmed in is the two bar highs. So I can see the two bar highs that actually give it an extra bar until the current bar completes. And I can give you the formula if you want. And I'm gonna show the two bar high and two bar lows a lot. And I have those plotted out on my 15 minute charts to so keep an eye on them. But anyway, UVXY, SVXY, very complex vehicles. I wouldn't, I wouldn't hold them longer term. Again, but shorter term they might work out. And uh, Larry McMillan was once telling me that there's some people that go on CNBC and talk about these things, and they've got it all wrong. So just know that it's a very complex vehicle, and it might not be the best vehicle for what I'm doing, but this is, it seems to be working. So this is what I'm using for now, at least. So the VIX tends to get stretched away from its means. Remember that the, the VIX is a volatility-based market. It's, it's a volatility index. That's what VIX stands for. And you have to understand volatility. Volatility tends to get stretched. It tends to dry up. And it tends to revert back to the mean. And all of those things I'm going to show you now. And by the way, don't rush out and, and try to trade this stuff right away. But do learn it, and I think that if you wait patiently, you could have the mother of all opportunities with this stuff. And again, I'm going to flesh that out in a few minutes. Now, stretch can always become more stretch. In fact, that's one thing that Larry taught me early on, is volatility team tends to overshoot itself. Now, you're going to need some kind of trigger signal, like I said last week, to make sure that the reversion to the mean move has started. You don't want to buy a market because it's oversold or buy or sell a market because it's overbought. You want to wait for some sort of reversion to the mean to begin to happen. And by the way, I do not believe in reversion to mean type trading in the overall market, but I think intraday with the VIX because that's how volatility behaves, okay? Volatility does not trend. And I see people draw like uh, head and shoulders on volatility and all this stuff. I'm like, that's not how it works. That's, that's not how any of this works. Anybody remember? What's your name, Beatrice? <laughs> so this is kind of my premise and what I kind of set out to prove on an intraday basis. So let's say we get 10% or more stretched away. And again, these kind of look a little bit like the VIX systems I published for the short-term trading, which I use as possible signals, but I don't actually use them. I don't actually trade them in and of themselves, but it does help me to kind of gauge the market. And I'm looking for that reversion to the mean move, but I'm looking for that to happen intraday. Get in when it looks like it's beginning to revert back and then get out on the close. And hopefully make a little cha-ching on the side. Now, a possible trigger would be 
high greater than yesterday's high or an expansion of range. So getting back to my chart from last week, the I put the S&P 500 in the background just so you can kind of see how it's behaving relative to the VIX. The VIX is the funny looking chart behind it. I don't know what you call those charts, but it's a funny looking chart. And the 10 day moving average, the simple moving average is my mean, okay? So what I have programmed down below is how far it's stretched, so to speak, away from the mean. And 10% is what I put in Dave Landry on swing trading 20 something years ago. And it seems to be a good round number for a stretched sort of situation to VIX. Years ago, Larry Connors had some hard numbers like VIX 15 or something or whatever. And I think that was an investment hedge fund secrets or whatever the name of that book was. My apologies. Investment secrets of a hedge fund manager, something like that. And the the VIX became normalized for a much higher level. So that no longer worked. But when he was explaining the VIX to me, I started messing around with moving averages. And I figured that the moving average would normalize to the price. And so it stretched normal normalized to its moving average and that's how the moving averages came to be in the VIX stuff what i have on the bottom is a lot of the research that i was using on the holy grail days now if you're trading intraday you don't get the benefit of the over overnight gap you also don't get whacked on the overnight gap too as sometimes happens so you only have the high minus the low as your range to trade and what I did here was, if you can't read the formula, I can publish them in Facebook. But what I did here was I took the high minus the low, that's the range that you could trade, the tradable range, and then compared it to the 10-day average true range. By the way, I, and I guess I should have said this coming into the presentation, I meant to, but I, 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 got, I must have deleted a slide or two on the intro. If you're just tuning in tonight, hang on because the stuff that I normally do is a lot more simpler than this. This is this is as crazy as I usually get with my research. And that's only because we're looking at a volatility instrument. Most of the time I do the trend following moron stuff and I'm known for that. And I know you guys here know what that is because you call yourselves that sometimes. <laughs> but uh, a lot of my clients do call themselves fellow TFM when they introduce themselves to me like, okay, fellow TFM, so it's like, okay, I know where I'm coming from. This guy's a trend follower too. Anyway, so that's the basic chart. And there's one more thing I added to it, which I'll show you in just one second. So here's what I was looking for in an actual chart. Notice that we were stretched 22% below, okay? And notice, by the way, I was stretched for a while. Like I said, stretch can become more stretched, okay? And I don't remember, but this might've been that, that trade I showed you earlier from last Wednesday. But anyway, you can see it, it became stretch, 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 and then bam, it begins to revert back to the mean. It does that intraday for a really nice trade, okay? Now I did find some of that, and you can see like right here, we had a 12% stretched situation and then it reverted back to the mean very nicely the next day. And that's that's what I was looking for. And I was hoping to find a plethora of those. I know, it means a lot when I, when I use that term, right? Uh, and I didn't find as many as I thought I would, but I found a lot of other interesting stuff. Interesting to me because I could make money off of it and hopefully interested to you too. And I went back and looked at that. I went back and looked at that day and you could see that it was a very nice, persistent move higher, and it didn't make any two-bar lows. Now, Paul was asking me earlier about a Bollinger Band, and I'm not sure how they would settle in based on the prior day's trading, but this, yeah, would probably hug the top of the Bollinger Band, but you could also just draw a trend line below the lows, or as I like to do, a line through the bars for persistency. So provided you could have held through the midday Consolidation, once again, all afternoon, except right into the close, you had two bar, no two bar lows, I should say. And then right in the close where you'd be getting out anyway, it did make a two bar low. Now, here's some of the things I found 
for lack of a better word, an aversion from the mean or aversion to the mean, no, from the mean, I guess would be the way to say it. Sometimes you get these huge wide range bars. Now this is asymmetrical to the upside and bear with me, that's gonna make a lot more sense in a few minutes, I promise. But you can see it opened right at the mean or right at the 10-day moving average. And then it made this really, 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 really nice pop higher. And that's, uh, what's that, about 30% in one day? I mean, that's just that's just absolutely print money. I mean, let's say you had 1,000 shares on and you make 13, 14 points. Whew, that'd be nice, right? Yeah, hell yeah. And you can see that it went from zero because it's right at the mean to 25%. Now, a little indicator down here shows us that, or illustrator, whatever you want to call it, that we're 25% away in that one day. And that would have been that would have been the mother of all days. And you could see that also the S&P did have a bit of a slide in the background. And the range increased to 210% of its normal range. Here's another case where this thing just absolutely took off 23 to 37. In those leverage shares, that's maybe twice that move or three times that move. And you can see that we were at zero and we went to 60, so zero to 60 in one day. And if you look at the range on that, that's a 600% increase over the normal daily range for the last 10 bars. Now, obviously the market imploded that day, and I think if memory serves, there was a bit of a gap down and it kept on going, but it was a very persistent slide and it was very tradable. Now. You would have had some serious gyrations to do here, and I'll I'll kind of touch upon money management towards the end to help you ride those out. But again, 600% move, and this is what I called last week on the fly a supernova type of day. Now, as I alluded to earlier, the skew or the asymmetry is going to be mostly on the upside, except doing upside, except during upside over extremes. And I'll explain that again in one second. I promise I'll get to all this. But one thing that Larry had taught me too, I picked up a lot from Larry early on. I was blessed to get able to be able to work with him. He explained to me that that a VIX or some sort of implied volatility, however you want to look at it, in something like a commodity might be skewed to the upside because it might be some sort of a drought or some sort of famine or whatever the case may be that would cause an extreme move to the upside in a commodity so your your volatility skew is going to be to the upside or your asym asymmetry easy for me to say would be to the upside wow i can see <laughs> and uh, it's something like the stock market where people panic and the stock market kind of comes unglued that's going to be to the downside. So the VIX move would be opposite of the stock market would be up during those conditions. Now, remember, just to further complicate matters, that the VIX is based on puts and calls. It's not just the price of puts, but all that stuff goes crazy. In general, the VIX just goes absolutely nuts. And if you can keep your head while everyone is losing theirs, it's not going to be every day, I can promise, but every now and then, if you sit and wait and wait and wait, you're going to get one of these print money kind of days. I can almost guarantee it. So here we go, right here, you can see the upside asymmetry, so to speak, if that's the right word. <laughs> I need to look up all these words. But you can see that it was a 1,400% increase. Now, that, didn't ha that doesn't happen every day. This was a pretty serious slide. And the overall market, as you can see in the background. And you can see that the, again, the S&P's had a pretty good slide and this thing just absolutely took off. And it ran 180% from the mean, okay? So that's pretty, pretty impressive. Now, what I also added into this chart, and this is another one of the patterns that I found. So. What I was thinking was, okay, well, we've got the VIX stretched to the downside. Let's look for that reversion to the mean move the next day. And I'm still going to look for that. And I'm still going to look for the same thing from the upside to the downside. 
But one of the patterns that was pretty cool that I unearthed from all this is when you have these upside ogres that are extreme. Now, to the downside with the VIX, it's just going to kind of dry out, dry out, dry out, and then bam, and it'll bore you to death, and all of a sudden it'll take off. And that's why you really want to pay attention to that range. And you don't want to touch the VIX if it's less than 50% on that range as a general statement. And I would go as far to say is maybe much higher than that. And I know it's kind of hard. You get a little antsy, you want to just jump in. And I made that mistake once last week. But maybe as much as 100% on the VIX before getting too excited. But you can see in this particular case, the opening gap, it was very substantial in here. And then it imploded. And I think the candle people call it a shave top, where the it opens almost at its high. So the beauty of that is if you are a little early, you can stop out above the high. You can maybe take a stab at it or let it convict itself or, or show some conviction, I should say, and then put your stop in above the high for starters. But you can see that it really stretched away from the moving average. Now, keep in mind, this is, I added this little purple line in here. This is how far the open is. And if you could read this formula, I use the open instead of the closing prices. So you would see that in real time. So here we're 40% or more away from that moving average before that reversion to the mean move took place. And on the range for the day, it's 210%. In the VIX, if you have just a narrow choppy range day, less than 50%, and maybe even less than 100%, you're likely to get chewed up, okay? So as I just said, 50% is a good starting point and maybe a little bit more. Now, keep in mind, like, that's on a non-opening gap reversal trade. So on something like what I just showed, it, it gaps up 40% away from the mean, you don't worry about the range so much then. You do let it get going. You do make sure it starts going in your direction, but you don't get too excited about the range. Of course, use caution on an inside day unless the prior day is super wide. Pay attention to the inside day. Pay attention to the prior day's range and see where it is within that range. If it's super wide and your percentages are high, greater than 50%, then you might be okay. And then again, take it to some sort of uh, some sort of trigger, maybe a breakout intraday, maybe take it out the prior day's high or low for whatever the case may be. And in that opening range, when you have that that ogre, you might still want to give it a little bit of range on your range indicator to make sure it's beginning to revert back to that mean. Maybe not jump in right on the open. Now, this whole thing is, I was hoping it would, it would occur a lot more often, but I need to take a step back and look at what I have found here. And I think it's possibly a money lying in the corner kind of situation more than a grind it out kind of day. Now, I know it's very, it could seem a little elusive and it would take a tremendous amount of patience, but at 1,200% day where it moves 12 times more than it did over the average of the last 10 days, you would really just absolutely print money on a day like that. And you really ha would have to bide your time and, and not look too much at those flickering ticks because that might suck you in on a day-to-day -day basis. But take that 30,000 foot view and see where you are and look at where you are percentage-wise and maybe try to pay attention to the daily chart as opposed to stared at too many of those little bars. So this is what I was saying about the 50% or less. You can see you just have a tremendous amount of trading where the volatility just dries up. There's nothing, absolutely nothing to do if you're less than 50% on the range. And again, I can post these formulas in Facebook if you want them. And then anything above 50%, you might think about actually taking a trade. And here's what's pretty amazing. Here are the 300 or more percent wide range bars. So I would imagine on those days, there would have been 
an opportunity once you're in that route and once you know you're in that route. And I'm not saying rush out a trade at a big size, but maybe take a small size on during those huge route type of days. Now, there is a beauty in the empirical research. Empirical research is a fancy way of saying hand testing. And it's a kind of long story. I don't long story endless. <laughs> once, I get to, once I get to telling it. But how can I give you the Reader's Digest version? Years ago, this individual contacted me. And he didn't he didn't say, I've got the Holy Grail, but he thought he had something extra special. And he had me go through it to learn the system. And I was going to be a technician for a, a, a hedge fund. And you know, so many side stories in this, but he felt confident he could raise his 100 million. And I started looking at his system, so to speak. And I realized pretty quickly that it was a holy grail hunt. And what he did was he compiled these books based on his all, all his observations going back for 30 years or so in bonds. And then I would go through these books, book after book after book. And I actually wore a few mouse, uh, man, how do you say that? Mice clicking the mice because I clicked it so many times to go back and forth on the charts or one day at a time that I wore out the mice. And um, anyway, one thing I found was that the moving average, like if here's the price point and here's the price point, the moving average would look like this, but it would look like you could see half of that moving average. So he had like a signal that would buy when that moving average was going up, but you wouldn't know that that moving average went up until after the fact. So that's one reason why his system worked really well because the map was not the territory. So it, you'll learn a lot of things by walking through the charts by hand. Now those supernova situations, as I, as I said a second ago, could really happen from a non-reversion to the mean situation. In fact, I would almost venture to say that a lot of times they happen actually from the moving average, which is kind of interesting. And, and I think that needs to be fleshed out a little further. And again, as I said a minute ago, you get these stretch situations that occur in the open, and that's why I added that little open indicator, illustrator in there, just to tell me how far it gapped above the moving average. So I know how big of a reversion to mean move to, to I don't want to say expect, but to uh, to wish for. And, you know, it's not a holy grail. It's going to be a lot of fake outs and shake outs along the way. And psychologically, you're going to have to be careful not to get too excited. I, I took my first trade on this. And, and keep in mind that I've been doing VIX research for 30 years, okay? So it's not like I discovered something and traded the next day, although maybe I'm a little guilty of that. But I knew it was conceptually correct. I knew that I had something. And I've studied these type of things for, like I said, a long, long time. But I did get a little sucked into things because my first trade at work, the second trade, or the second day, I should say, I decided not to take any trades based on everything I just told you. And the third day I took it, which would be the second trade, I printed money. And in hindsight, it's like, eh, you know, maybe I was pushing the envelope a little bit. And my fourth trade, or my third trade, I should say, did not work out at all. And I, I could tell where I was trying to force the issue. So I'm still guilty of all these bad behaviors that, that we all are. And you have to really be disciplined when you're doing this type of trading and this type of research. And it's really something that you really need to wait for to happen. Now, sometimes you can get a gap and go, and sometimes, or like maybe like a lap and go after a wide range bar, and those can lead, lead to some real impressive moves. And as I flesh all this out further, I'll see if I can find some of those type of setups for you. Now, would it be possible to capture a piece of an extreme wide range bar if it were in a route and it already moved 100% of the normal range. So that's, as I was saying earlier, and that's something that I'm working on is, is maybe even way to 100%. And you can capture one of these 600% moves on the range, okay? 
intraday, and that would be huge in these leverage shares. So here's 600 percent. Obviously, it went 100 percent first. So you wait and wait and wait and see if it could go 100 percent. It looks like it's keep on going. It'd be kind of scary, but you could jump in with a small size. And if it works, you would absolutely print money. You wouldn't need a huge position. You know, 100 shares and something like this, and it goes 30 or 40 points. That's not a bad day's wage, right? Probably a bad term to use wages because obviously you're not going to get daily wages in this. So here's a really cool, and this is something I'm kind of waiting for and excited about. I don't know, I'm a nerd, but. If I could make money doing this, then I could I could do things with that money, and that's kind of exciting, right? So you've got a stretched intraday ogre here, and I didn't have this was from last week. I didn't have my little ogre indicator in there, but it was about already 10% to begin with. So this is probably like 30 or 40%, and you can see that it made a 200% range expansion coming back in. Now, what's cool is you had your opening gap reverse in the morning, and let's say you just sat on your hands and said, well, Dave says, make sure this range begins to develop before I get too excited. So let's say if you did sit on your hands and you just watch this thing say, okay, we've got a range in the works. I'm going to put an entry in above that range, and that would have been a really decent trade waiting for that breakout to occur. Then you had a nice move higher the rest of the day. All right, a couple of random thoughts. Number one, understand what you are trading. It's very complex, okay? The the concepts I'm discussing aren't that complex. Do I have a rubber band on my desk? This desk is a mess. Let me clean it. Uh, I've been working on my studio and everything else just falls apart. But all we're looking at is that rubber band gets stretched and snapped back. That's pretty much it in a nutshell, right? The VIX itself, oh Lord, it's a derivative of a derivative, okay? Options are a derivative and it's a derivative of that. And if you wanna make life even more complex, it's a hypothetical derivative, okay? Because they're looking at a hypothetical 30-day option, a hypothetical at the money option. And the formula is about that big. I don't think you need to, understand the formula but understand how volatility works and how people get really excited and those things just get pushed to extreme and we're there to take the other side of that trade now to further complicate things i'm noodling around with these vix etf futures and by the way unless it's a route day they will chew you up and spit you out okay so tread lightly while you're learning this stuff but if you want to further complex, further complicate things, a VIX ETF future is a derivative of a derivative of a derivative. And I think I have that right because futures are a derivative, options are a derivative, and an ETF is also a derivative. And then throw in that hypothetical thing in there, which makes up the formula. So that's that's almost like an extra derivative you throw in there. Now it it behaves a lot like volatility. Volatility gets stretched away from the mean, snaps back. It often overshoots, as I said earlier, and then it could dry up for a while. I wonder if, um, I hope I didn't give it away, but Sheldon Natenberg, excuse me, wrote a book on option pricing and volatility or something. And a lot of, a lot of this type of stuff is in there. And that's what kind of the, the beginning of the research for some of this stuff came from. And I know Larry Connors read that too. And he recommended he had recommended to me, but it's it's not very exciting reading. Uh, no offense, I mean it's hard to make this stuff exciting, but when you can reap the fruits of that labor, though, that's when it that's when it matters, right? And speaking of when it matters, it matters when it matters because the victims just dry up for a long, long time, and don't worry about it, right? Leave it alone. But then all of a sudden, you start getting stretched, and you start getting these reversion to the mean moves and these these explosive intraday moves that we just talked about then that's when you go in and make your money like anything though you could get chewed up really badly in the meantime i don't want to just show you the good i want to show you the bad and the ugly so less is more i'm i'm now especially looking for the occasional money lying in the corner and not a daily paycheck a daily paycheck would be fantastic 
but that's a bit of a grail hunt and, and wishful thinking, right? But if you could wait until you've got one of these huge, or until you have one of these huge, my wife's going to correct me if she listens to this, uh, when she's trying to fall asleep tonight, she listens to it. <laughs> but if you have one of these huge days that are happening, especially those opening gap reversal things, I'm kind of getting excited about those. Then you, then it could be a little bit of money lying in the corner. And by, by the way, I think that's about the only time that you can really do exceptionally well in the in the SVXY, the short VIX, because that volatility just gets so out of whack, it just absolutely implodes. So that's the that's the secret there. I think in general, the short VIX is going to be a little bit tougher to trade than the long VIX because the long VIX you wait until it's kind of obvious and you get that reversion to the mean move and you get that huge market move to the downside and you get those route days developing and that's that's when you absolutely will make your week your month and sometimes maybe a year but again not a paycheck the secret here is keep your powder dry then print some money and by the way don't try this at home until you're successful trading the trend following moron stuff the simple stuff okay until you have gotten into a trade and took the swing trade profits and rode it out for a year and a half or however long it's been that we've been riding out the ARLP. And then if you wrote something like CPE, you're like, okay, I get it, Dave. We gotta be patient, we gotta take the best setups, we're gonna get in them, we're not gonna micromanage them and all those other things we preach. Until you get some of that success under your, vet, under your belt, don't try anything like this at home. Now again, man, when it works, it's like butter. Psychologically and from a neurological perspective, you gotta be really, really careful. Because we like to keep those good vibes going. And, and I've got, like I said, I, I did two fantastic trades here. And I was just dying to do the next one. And I think I might have gotten a little overzealous and I lost my ass on that third one. Net, net, I'm okay, but let's just see how it works longer term. And luckily, I did go in and look at the longer term trades. And I was above water with these things longer term. So I feel a little bit better about that. But let the market come to you and just walk over and pick up that money when it's there. If it's not, leave it alone. And it's learning how to say no and just pass and let let the mediocre market go without you. And if you reach a point where you can't stand it and then that range does begin to expand and you've got some other pattern there and it might not be 100%, then by all means, jump in. But learn how to trade less, not more with this. And that's the irony. The longer you're trading, the more you look for reasons not to trade, the more reasons you look to not put that capital into harm's way. Now, I'll put this in last minute. Your initial profit targets are your best friend, and I would strongly urge you to use them. So let's say you're looking for just a round number. Let's say you're looking for one point, okay? Then put that initial profit target in there. Let's say you get in the UVXY. I don't even know where it's trading right now. Let's say you get in at 20 and you just look, you're looking for one point. Then by all means, put that one point profit in there because sometimes it'll just spike up. There'll be just this little bit of excitement. It'll spike up and you'll hit your IPT and you might scratch out the remainder, but that's okay. So make sure you have that in there. The automated trailing stops can work really good too, especially after that spike gets hit. One thing that I think you would have to do, especially once you have that route day, is you just have to start loosening them, loosening them and loosening them. So you might have, let's say you've got five points open profits, you, know, you might end up with like a three point trailing stop. And then that might go to four points when you get five points and then six points when you get seven or eight or nine or whatever. Just let that slowly gradually open up, just like we do with the the daily trading. Look at the stop on ARLP. ARLP to stop on that was one dollar, if memory serves, because I know I put on a couple thousand shares in one account, and then I know I did at least a couple hundred, couple thousand shares in another, and that was based on a one point stop, two percent, hundred k account in those particular situations. So I know that I know those round numbers stick in my head and after all is said and done with this one i'll show you those trades or at least one set of those trades so you can see them but that was so far knock on wood come in uh that was because we were able to ride out the reason we were able to ride out that longer term trend was we let that stop widen out over time all the things i preach each week 
Now, I'm going to say this again this week because I get emails all the time. And it, it's like every day I've been fielding emails. It's like, yes. And as I told you guys in the Facebook group, that's the beauty of the Facebook group. I get to reach all of you guys at once. And you guys can reach me too all at once and we can all participate. But somebody says, was it, was it a TFM 10% system a buy signal recently? And the answer is yes, it was, okay? And I'll just go through this quick because I've gone through this a dozen times. But if you squint your eyes, you can see the low is greater than the moving average. Now, I didn't notice that at the time. And as I said a few weeks back, the designer's intent was not to buy on weakness, but more so to buy on strength. And again, you guys, thanks to you guys for showing me this, keep me honest and make sure that I recognized it. But at the time, there was a lot of reasons that I didn't like the market in general. And by the time I saw this signal, or by the time the signal actually triggered, so to speak, the market had already rolled back over. So it didn't go with designer's intent, but I did record it and I'll show you it in the spreadsheet. So the, my thinking again, as I said quite a few times is, I'd rather buy on strength, maybe above this high or even above a two bar high in this particular particular situation, especially when the market still looks like it's iffy and in the early phases of rolling over. Now, in between that buy, we had the two sell signals, obviously, and now we're back under a sell signal for those keeping score. Speaking of score, I updated the spreadsheet here. And if you put the last trade in, you did get whacked for 5%, okay? That's called the whipsaw. Shit happens, <laughs> you know, sometimes twice. As I was in the grocery store once and there was a very large woman behind me and I knocked something over and I said, shit happens, I guess. And she said, sometimes twice. So sometimes twice. <laughs> Looks like sometimes twice is back here. You had a little bit of a whipsaw, but so what, okay? That was 2000. No, this was actually, you lost money. Yeah, this was a whipsaw. Here you lost 4% and you're probably pissed off, right? Well, you could have lost 44% more of your money by holding on. And this is the whole purpose of the system is to avoid the so-called Ian McActivy diaper change moments, okay? So yeah, you did have a bit of a slide in here, which happened after the signal and you got knocked out, but now you're out of the market and so far, you avoided 11% slide since that occurred. So yeah, you might've got knocked out for 5%. You just have to live with that. But your diaper change is now up to double digits. And believe me, that's fairly significant. All right, any questions on all this stuff? And, and I think we're still scratching the surface on this. And I'm gonna keep fleshing it out as time allows. So you won't see the, this is not the end of it, especially if I can make it work, okay? All right, let's shift gears real quick. Let's take a look at uh, crypto. And I doubt we'll have anything to look at there. If you want to take a look at any, any stocks, you can start asking about those now. We're going to jump into the market in just one second. And for your crypto pairs, until we get the stocks at least, put a dollar sign in front of them. Holy crypto, Batman. <laughs> Yeah, crypto, you know, boy, I tell you, every day I wake up thinking, or nearly every day at least, and I think about how amazing crypto was. And it was just, you know, anytime you feel like something is too good to be true, usually it is, and it was. And But that's okay, okay? We're not going to get, uh, we're not going to get too excited about that. It is what it is again. So as I've been saying quite a bit, and this might go for any market for that matter, but your the 50 EMA is your absolute best friend. And again, it's not just the, the crypto market, but pretty much any market. Kelly McGillis was hot a long time ago also. <laughs> yeah. So we'll call uh we'll call cryptocurrencies uh the Kelly McGinnis, what's her name? Kelly McGinnis Market. Although you, well, I shouldn't say it. It's like you go back and look at some of these people that when you were younger, you thought they were high. You're like, they're not high. So there's a few in here you can see that are moving. I don't know why it's putting a stupid little thing on there. But even the ones that are moving, a lot of these things are below the moving average, okay? And just 
waiting for the pair to rise above that moving average and then look for a setup. That in and of itself will keep you out of a lot of troubles. So let's take a look at, anybody know how to turn this off? Uh, let's take a look at, just let me just show you something real quick and we'll take a look at the biggies and then we'll hop at the stocks. But if you take a look at these, these percent loss moves, how much fun was that? We used to do the, the RS trading in these and just absolutely printed money, but that didn't last long. But as you go through these, notice the ones below the 30 EMA and notice how they're absolutely decimated. And just that stupid little moving average would keep you out of so much trouble. And even when they do go above the average, wait for a little follow through and setups because you just saw a couple of those spiked above them, then they came right back in. So crypto is in a horrible bear market, remains in a horrible bear market. I, Although I am a crypto bull, at least I was at one point in time, not so much anymore because of going up, right? That's why I was bullish, you know? But um, let's see if we can fix this. Nope. They're not going up anymore. So let's take a look at Bitcoin real quick. Bitcoin, look at that, 29,000, okay? Look at the Landry light to the downside. Highs less than the moving average. And you can really see that in the ACP platform, which is kind of cool. I do like that. And let's take a look at Ethereum. Ethereum, not so hot either, right? Look at that. In fact, it's kind of losing more steam tonight. All right, anybody want to look, look at any of these crypto pairs and it's amazing how many shit coins, SHYT, they keep coming out with. I, I added about a dozen of them this morning, or maybe even 20 or 30, and they all look like crap. <laughs> so they're uh, appropriately named. All right, let's shift gears. Let's go take a look at the, the overall market. And if you guys want to start punching in some stocks now, that'd be great. So here's that VIX thing I was telling you about. Okay, real simple stuff. And I think I could share this template here. But again, this is how far you're, you are away from the moving average. Okay, this was a reversion to mean move there. So I did play, I played this one. I sat on my hands on this one. I played this one. Somehow I got lucky. I'm not sure exactly what pattern I used. And then on one of these other days, I got a little antsy and got burnt. So it's like you have to learn and relearn a lot of lessons when it comes to the market. Let's take a look at, speaking of the market, let's take a look at the overall market, and then let's drill down to some sector action. All right, S&P 500, decent rally today, up 2%, but hey, back that chart way out. And as you can see, it's not looking so hot. Let's throw a bow tie in there. And you can see daily bow ties are in downtrend proper order. 10 simple, less than 20 exponential, less than 30 exponential. Say hello to your little friend. Notice that it is headed lower and looks like we're trying to retrace back to that 30 EMA. But I wouldn't get too excited just yet. Or as I often say, let's, let's start kissing each other just yet. The bow tie rollover is a little sloppy on the weekly. It's not absolutely perfect, but you can see we are in downtrend proper order. And as I preach ad nauseum, that in and of itself could help to keep you on the right side of bull and bear markets, bull and bear markets, bull and pretty ugly period of time. Okay, back here, it was uglier than it looks. And the pandemic was a little late because moving averages on a weekly basis can be a little late. That's okay. We had a TFM 10% system, which woke us up to the fact that, hey, this could get ugly. And I think the TFM 10% system, if memory serves, actually triggered before the downside moving average. Let's take a look at the NASDAQ, a little bit of a bounce there today. Let's not start kissing each other just yet. My big problem with these indices is, as I've been saying, a nauseam is, and this was back way back here, and especially on the Rusty, I said, well, if we take out these old lows, there's no support for long ways. And so far, that has been true. And I do, by the way, I did like the way, as I would say quite a bit, my big fear was that this market would rally up just enough to make everybody think the water's fine. And I, I, don't pay, I don't pay attention to anyone else, but I do 
when the market begins to rally like this, and I'm concerned that it's getting ready to cause the most pain and most amount of people and roll right back over, I do kind of start listening a little bit and start watching headlines. And there were a lot of bullish headlines right in here. And that had me concerned and that we could roll back over. And if we do, a lot of people are gonna be wrong. All right, let's take a look at the Rusty. Yeah, we'll take a look at that. Put spread, I, I like to just do regular outright options. I know the options people are probably cringing, but if you have a position, if you wanna take a position, take a position, you know? Now you can see Russell, a little bit of a rally again. This was my big concern a while back. We took up these lows, no support for a long, long way. So that's pretty ugly. About the only thing looking really good, look at the energies, bam. They're like tiny up, look at them, look at them energies, huge. Up uh, what, 1% and change? That's a pretty big feat for this market. And it's beginning to accelerate higher, which is good. I was a little nervous because we had this little consolidation here, but now we're beginning to push higher. And I'd like to see it go even more higher and then start playing some pullbacks along the way. Metals of mining though, just the opposite, not so hot as you can see, but they've been coming back quite a bit and they have a lot of support below the market. I wouldn't rush out and buy them, I'd leave them alone, but I also would not short them. Now here's something that's concerning is consumer non durables. This should be a defensive area because you still have bodily functions in a bear market, right? And I was looking at P&G earlier as a consumer non-durables. And as I was telling my peeps in the service, it just has so much support below. It's a nice little short, okay? But it has so much support below, I don't think it's worth going after. Maybe maybe Paul will put a put spread on that or something. Uh, if you do, knock, if you knock yourself out and do that, or if you do that, uh, let me know how it turns out. But I, I like to play for a big win, like ARLP, for instance. I just got through telling you about an intraday trade, then, I'm, then I'll tell you how I like to play for a big win. This is what your real money is. This is what I'd rather do. Get into something like this, okay, and knock on wood, a couple hundred percent move so far, so far so good. And that's where the real money is. And here's the thing, you know, down here, you're only risking one point. So on 100K account, like I said earlier, you put it on 2,000 shares and you peel them off when you hit that IPT, right? And then way up here, then you've got maybe 10 times your original risk. And that's where everything begins to pay off. So I, I prefer doing that, uh, Paul, as opposed to directional play. But hey, don't let me muck you up. If you're good at what you do, then, then keep on doing it. There's really no need to go through all these sectors. Most look the same. Downtrends followed by pullback. That's biotech. Real estate's been pretty ugly in here. How's that for an oxymoron from a trend following moron? Health services, defense. This is kind of interesting because in I've been looking for setups here, but see this big mountain of trading. If you take a look at like GD, General Dynamics, there's a there's a mountain of support below. So I just really can't find any shorts to get excited about at this juncture. I have one on the service tonight as an honorable mention. I think it's in a lot of trouble, but it too has support below the market. Again, as you go through these manufacturing downtrend followed by a pullback. All right, uh, let me just take a look at the dollar and bonds, and then we'll we'll take a look at your stock picks. Here's bonds, all right? Bonds down, rates up. So that's kind of interesting, as you can see. So that's pretty darn ugly there. And then the dollar has got me concerned in here. And, I, you know, the dollar only matters when it matters. In a market technical analysis, only matters when it matters. But you've got to be on your toes for when it matters. Just like I said earlier, the VIX only matters when it matters. Don't try to force something to, help, to happen in the meantime, but do pay attention to intermarket technical analysis. And if this dollar begins to crack, let's look for some reverber reverberations, easy for me to say, throughout the system. And Bitcoin, as you saw earlier, in a pretty ugly bear market, that's a bit of a bummer. Everybody in that brother was thinking, this is gonna be the new frontier. And we're gonna go in and, and buy Bitcoin and it's gonna go up when the stock market goes down and it's gonna go up when the dollar goes down, which sometimes it does. Anyway, it's kind of ironic. I've got my, uh, I found this in my last move, my 100K note, oh, my 100K note, $100 trillion. I used, 
I messed this one up. It was uncirculated, but like I said, I bought a stack of them once for like a dollar each, and I would throw them out at lunch. And now they're, they're actually worth something as a collector's value. But you know, here's the thing. Here's This is something scary. In South Africa, you can't even wipe your butt with these. With these. <laughs> you know, this is how worthless they are. There's actually signs, and I've showed, and I've stole that from Ian McActivity too, but there's actually signs on the bathroom saying, don't throw diapers in the toilet, do not use Zim notes <laughs> in lieu of toilet paper. All right, HSY, you want to take a look at that spread? HSY, what's your spread on that, Paul? Uh, let's see, 17 June, 220, 200. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's, that's decent looking, you know. Um, why wouldn't you just i hear you and the shorts are tough um you know i prefer if it had a, like a gradual rollover and this big drop here was uh your um somehow you know in the in this chart i prefer more than one big down day you do have quite a bit of support on the way down but i can see where it could break through that and i certainly can't fault the trade it looks it's pretty good i'll give you a high five on that one but I I like just take that position trade because here's the deal. What's going to happen is you get to 200. It's like you only want this thing to go to 200 and expire because anything below that, then you can start owing money on that sharp put. So just not a fan of that unless unless you unless you have some sort of strategy where you peel that off as it decays or dries up or whatever, and then you kind of go long so to speak. But then you end up with a lot of moving parts, but I, I'm impressed. It's a good, good trade. It's a bow tie. Again, lots of uh, support or a significant amount of support below, but yeah, good look at trade. So I have to agree with you on that one. Looks like it broke up trend. Thoughts on possible move down. I'm in the money. Yeah, I'm not a, I, I'm not a huge fan of using trend lines, but I hear what you're saying. I and mean, that's not a perfect one, but yeah, it did. What I like to do instead is look at something like the bow ties or first thrust or some sort of other pattern like that. And here's the deal. This is a food, okay? And you would think, especially being a um, candy bar, right? People would be like, would want that comfort food during a bear market. So that's a little scary. But yeah, I agree with you. It looks like it's in trouble for sure, for sure. All right, any more? I know we talk about stocks all day in Facebook, but we might have a couple of new people here tonight. You're welcome, Paul. Good job. All right, going once, going twice. All right, well, I want to thank everybody for attending tonight. I appreciate you taking time with a busy schedule. Bear with me on this Vic stuff. I'm still working on it. I know it's not the normal trend following moron stuff, but I promise we'll get back to regularly scheduled programming really quick. Oh, by the way, likely no show next week. Hard for me to put together a show on a shortened week, and I've got so many other... I've got some uh, business with China I got to deal with, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna try to catch up on all that stuff next week. So no show, probably no trading simplified show either. So everybody enjoy your your holiday if we don't talk again, and uh, I'll see the rest of you guys and girls at Facebook tomorrow. Paul says great stuff, very interesting. Thank you, Paul. Appreciate it. Thank you for your time and efforts, Dave. Have a great holiday. You too, Sam. So yeah, happy uh, Memorial Day if we don't um, talk between now and then. Thank you, everyone and made a trend be with you.